So our theme for tonight is the suffering of Christ and his passion to help prepare us for Holy Week. And next week, and we'll have the um, a talk on the Shroud of Turin, and we'll also have some, um, some visual aids to help us. So a full-scale um, image of the Shroud, um, courtesy of John Schulte. Okay, so, um, so tonight we'll look at the suffering of Jesus in his passion, and we'll focus more on the um, interior suffering, and then next week, we'll, when we look at the shroud, we'll see more graphically the physical suffering. But we'll talk about both tonight. Right. Now, reflection on the suffering of Jesus in his passion, it's the staple of Christian prayer. And when the saints have always uh, meditated long and perseveringly on the passion of Christ. It's the great subject of contemplation, Christian meditation. And it's easy to understand. The passion most graphically, most profoundly shows us the extent of God's love for man. God loved us so much that he gave his only son for us and gave him um, to suffer all that could be suffered by a human being. But when we look at the suffering, we always have to keep in mind that the suffering is motivated by love. And that's the meaning of the suffering. The suffering redeems us precisely because it's suffering through charity. To show the extent of his love. Right? He wanted to leave nothing undone and to make reparation for sin. Again, to leave nothing undone. But that very reparation was done out of love. Out of love for the Father offended by sin and out of love for man, the sinner who offends the father but he wishes to to restore right? and so St. Paul sums it up when he speaks about Christ and the cross Christ loved me and gave himself for me and right? so when we meditate on the passion that's what we're meditating on Christ's love, and precisely his love for each one. And it's not simply that he um, gave himself over to, to suffering for mankind, for humanity, for a cause, for uh, some great vision of a utopian future. No, for each and every human being that he knew intimately. And we'll talk more about that towards the end. Now, this was something that had been foretold by the prophets. And it's the most mysterious element of the Messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. That the Messiah would not simply be king to restore Israel, but would restore Israel precisely through suffering. And then we see that portrayed in many places. But most clearly, in the... Um, in the four canticles of Isaiah, the canticles of the suffering servant, from Isaiah 42 to 53, and especially Isaiah 53, shows us most graphically the suffering of the Messiah to reconcile man with God. And we all know the text. It's in the liturgy on Good Friday. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, 
Who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. We'll talk more about the last line next week, about when it speaks about his tomb. Now, with the wicked, that would be with regard to the, the crucifixion, Calvary. And then with the rich, that would be a reference to Joseph of Arimathea, um, one of the wealthiest men um, in Jerusalem. And so the, the picture we get of the Messiah is the extreme of suffering. He's defined, as it were, by so he's a man of sorrows. Right? That's his identity is to be that. Now the rabbinical tradition reflected on this text and other texts like it. For example, Psalm 22, which also speaks of the passion, the crucifixion. And the other text of Isaiah, of the Cant- the, the suffering servant. And the, rab- the rabbis, especially in the medieval period, um, speculate, tell tales about the suffering of the Messiah. And it's remarkable. We talked about that in the first lecture series. We had a, a, a talk on the, um, the prophecies of the Passion. And basically the, the medieval rabbis think that the, the Messiah would have to suffer for ages. For um, They speak of centuries in some sense. Suffering, um, a suffering that goes together with the suffering of the Jewish people, no, but in some sense is its um, exemplar or archetype. Right? And so they also recognize um, the suffering of the Messiah. It's just that in, from the Jewish perspective, it's so hard to put that together with the Messiah King. And so very often they divide the Messiah into two figures. One who is the suffering Messiah and the other who is the Messiah King. And of course we know that Christ is King precisely and most especially in his suffering. And it's his suffering that is the revelation of his glory. And the reason for that is because it's his suffering that works the victory over sin, that tramples on the serpent, that crushes the serpent's head, um, that conquers iniquity um, and redeems, buys back for him his people, the mystical body of Christ. And so John, when he speaks of, in the Gospel of John, the glory of Christ is when he will be lifted up from the earth, which is a reference not to the resurrection directly, but to the crucifixion. That's his glory, because that's the full revelation of the love of God. Okay, so the Gospels show us the realization of these prophecies to the letter. And so let's just go through the different kinds of suffering. On Good Friday, we apply these words to to Christ. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And also the verses from Lamentations in which Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, um, weeps over the destruction of Jerusalem in the first exile. 590 BC, 600 BC. And those get applied to Christ and also to Our Lady. And we'll touch on that at the very end. The words especially, see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow. In other words, that the history of the world is the history of sorrow, but there's no sorrow like unto Christ's. And so in what sense is that true? Did he suffer a compendium of all sorrows? And in some sense, we can say, yes, obviously he didn't suffer every different way that you could die, because you can only die one way. But... um, St. Thomas Aquinas in the, in the Summa, when he goes through the Passion, he shows that in some sense he suffered in all the different ways that we can, every variety of suffering in general, although not in particular. And, but the key point is this, in the highest degree in each one. So physical, interior, and the different kinds of interior suffering. Humiliation, betrayal, um, contrition, 
And so we'll, we'll go through them one by one. So let's begin with the, the first one that hits us, and that's physical suffering. Physical pain. And that's what's easiest to perceive. And here we know, and we'll see it more clearly next week when we look at the shroud, Christ suffered physical pain, intense, excruciating physical pain in every part of his body. Right? That's what the shroud shows us. And that's what the Gospels tell us. Right? There's not any part of his body that didn't participate in his work of redemption. But it's especially the most sensitive parts. Right? And the most sensitive parts of, of our body are those parts that have the most nerves, that have to be the most sensitive. And that is our hands. So the fact of being nailed to the cross rather than simply tied, being nailed, and the way they, they did this, the Romans were ingenious at torture, was to have the nails that hold the hands up go through the most sensitive nerves in our body. The nerves that, that lead to our fingers, no? that make us able to do all the marvelous things that we do with our hands. And so they would have, the nails would have um, pierced the, um, the medial nerve, doctors say, like the most sensitive of our nerves. And then the whole weight of his body would be um, on them. And then the way that death happens in crucifixion is through asphyxiation. And so to breathe, you need to pull yourself up, as it were. And what do you pull yourself up with? The wounds in the hands and in the feet. Right? So precisely the parts that are in the most excruciating pain would be that which you need to uh, aggravate in order to breathe. So doctors who write, there are two doctors in particular that, I, that I've read who've written about the Passion. Um, the earlier Pierre Barbet has a, a very famous book, A Surgeon at Calvary. He was a, um, a surgeon during World War I, or a doctor at Calvary, I forget the title. And then there's a more recent book, um, Dr. Frederick um, Zugibe, I'm not sure how we pronounce his name, um, The Cross and the Shroud, A Medical Inquiry into the Crucifixion. And he goes on um, at great length about the, the wounds in the hands. So the doctors speak of it as one of the worst tortures imaginable, an inexpressible pain. Darting like lightning through the fingers, surging up the soldier, shoulders, um, because the, the nerves would, uh, uh, would cause this, this pain um, like a trail of fire, a burning sensation. And the slightest movement, draft, um, would cause excruciating pain. And so especially the movement of the body in, in trying to breathe or in speaking. Oh, and this is very important. When we, when we read the Gospels, we don't think about this. Jesus speaking from the cross. I mean, he has to breathe to speak. And so when he entrusts his mother to John and through John to us, oh, that's, this is a testament that is being made in the most excruciating agony. Right? That, that adds also theologically to the meaning of it. Right? It's not simply something casual. Right? And so everything would have come together to increase, to aggravate the condition. And that's why the Romans did it this way. And then we combine that with whatever happened, with all that happened before that. The scourging, which in and of itself you know, could have killed the person. But they didn't want to kill him because, with the scourging because he had to be crucified. And that in itself would have caused afterwards extreme trauma. Right? After you've been scourged, then you would be suffering fever and chills and, and the, the um, effects of trauma. And then it was precisely those scourged shoulders that had to carry the cross as he then carried the cross up to Calvary. And at the same time, he has the, the crowning with thorns. And we'll, these things can be seen on the shroud. 
the, um, the wounds and the blood that come from the, the thorns, and we can get some idea of, um, of the pain and the, um, I don't know, headache is not the right word, that would come from the intense pain to the head from the crown of thorns. And then to add to that, dehydration from the, the sweating and the bleeding. And on top of it all, the night before, he had the, the greatest trauma interiorly, which caused the sweating of blood, which we'll look at later. But sweating of blood is a medical condition that um, can occur in the cases of the greatest interior psychological trauma. Right? And so that would have been before all the rest, which would have had him um, weakened from the start. And so that, and there's much more that could be, so this is just a, a tiny glimpse into his physical suffering. And so even though he didn't suffer all the kinds of suffering, he wasn't burned, um, he, wasn't, he didn't drown, but in some sense, every part of his body participated in the suffering. And this would have been aggravated um, by the fact that he's perfect man. In other words, Christ's physical constitution was that of unfallen man, perfect man. Right? That's why when we say that Christ is perfect man, perfect God, by perfect man we mean perfect in everything that has to do with humanity, and thus an unfallen perfection with this difference, that Adam was immune from suffering and death, but Christ was born to suffer and die, and so he didn't have that immunity from suffering but he would have had the perfect sensitivity because that belongs to the perfection of a human body, to be perfectly sensitive and thus more capable of feeling pain. And that would be true um, with regard to physical pain and even more true with regard to interior pain. Right? It's um, the people who are the most sensitive that most feel interior suffering. Oh, and that's, we'll see that at the end, that applies also to Our Lady that she too would share in his suffering in a uniquely um, intense way because of the perfection of her humanity immune from original sin. Okay. So again, there's much more that could be said, but we'll, we'll leave the physical part and look on at the interior part. And we'll come back next week to the physical when we look at the shrine. So let's begin with in Christ's interior suffering, we'll start with what's outermost and then go to what's interior. So, what's outermost is the exterior humiliation that he underwent. And here, too, he wanted to suffer the most extreme humiliation possible. And in, in all of these sufferings, there's a purpose. No, they're redemptive sufferings. And they're, he wanted to suffer all the kinds of suffering to redeem all the kinds of sin. Oh, and so humiliation redeems all the sins of pride and arrogance. You know, just as the pains of the flesh redeem all the sins of the flesh. And boy, this, this is very useful for us to remember when we do our examination of conscience. You know, that our sins of the flesh contribute to his, contributed to his pains of the flesh. And our sins of pride contributed to his yeah, humiliation. So what is the humiliation? Well, he, saw, he was publicly humiliated in the most public way possible, the day of the Passover. So in, in Jerusalem, in Israel, of Christ's time, the day in which he could be seen as a, as a blasphemer, as a criminal, by the most people would have been the Feast of the Passover. Right? That was the day in which the greatest influx of pilgrims came to Jerusalem. We don't know exactly how many, but later, um, about 30 years later, Josephus tells us that in the Passover, um, be shortly before the destruction of Jerusalem, there were something like a million people in Jerusalem for the Passover. So perhaps half a million people, we don't know. And then it was aggravated by so many different things. 
Right? So he's, he's condemned as a blasphemer, the greatest um, crime that man can commit. Right? Graver than you know, any kind of sexual sin, any kind of murder, because it's a sin that goes against the first commandment. Right? And that's graver. It's as if he's, he's being tried as being in, for a diabolic crime. You know, for a crime proper to Satan to proclaim yourself God when you're not. Right? So that would add to the humiliation. And then the fact that previously, just five days earlier, he was proclaimed as the Messiah by the crowds and given that welcome of Hosanna, the fickleness of the crowd, in some sense, adds to the, the humiliation. You who five days earlier were being acclaimed as, and now the mob is, is denouncing you. And then the humiliation of being sold, you know, being betrayed for a sum of money that was paltry, that was the price of a, a slave. And so that in itself is a tremendous humiliation. It's like the um, Joseph you know, being sold into Egypt for the price of a slave. And then the, sign, the very sign that Judas betrays him with the kiss is a humiliation. It's as if Jesus was taken in by Judas. Well, he doesn't react. He, of course, we know he wasn't taken in. But um, And then the, being, um, the choice that Pilate gives the people with Barabbas. Right? Which of these two do you want set free? And the fact that the people choose um, Barabbas. And in Mel Gibson's Passion, for those of you who have seen it, I thought that was magnificently portrayed. I mean, the way he made out Barabbas to be this uh, utterly um, vulgar person, no, who would be preferred to God made man, to God redeeming mankind. Right? And that all of this is is part of the divine providence. In other words, it was precisely in, willed by Jesus to redeem more perfectly. To redeem us more perfectly. Right? So it, to prefer this common criminal to, to God made man. And then he's taken before Herod when um, Pilate finds out, we talked about this last week, when Pilate found out he's from Galilee, sent him to, maybe he could get rid of this problem by sending him to Herod. And Herod treats him as if he was a vulgar magician. He wants to see a sign. And he doesn't do a sign. And so Herod treats him as a lunatic. Dresses him in white, mocks him, and sends him back to Pilate. As if he were a kind of circus spectacle. And then before Pilate, he's mocked again as a false king, clothed in purple, as if it were imperial purple, the Messiah king, yeah. and given a reed as a scepter. Treated as a false prophet, asked to prophesy who struck him. And then after being scourged, con he was condemned to be executed, obviously by the most ignominious death, apart from the pain, no, apart from the physical pain, and that between two common criminals as an added humiliation, as if he were, even though his charge is incomparably greater, the fact that he's put together with two other thieves somehow adds to the, a note of banality to it. And then he would have died completely stripped, apparently. Even though in art we, de we don't depict that out of modesty, um, Scholars say that in Roman crucifixions, you would be naked. Uh, and so he died with nothing of his own, not even his grave, not even any clothing. Perhaps. Um, and then on the cross, he wants, he wills to be mocked. And he's mocked in a very significant way. You know, the, 
the pastors might say, if you're really the son of God, and you are who you say you are, come down from the cross. And that in itself is a temptation. Right? That was the constant temptation that Satan would have been presenting to him to redeem the world in some other way than the depths of pain and humiliation. And so in all of these humiliations, he atoned for pride. And then here too, just as we said before, his because of his sensitivity, it would have been felt more deeply. Well, here, the humiliation is much, much in, infinitely, unspeakably greater given the real dignity of the person. No, because when you humiliate, say, a pope or a king, it's not an ordinary humiliation. There was an episode in the, um, in the beginning of the 14th century in which the king of France had his ambassador strike the pope. Boniface VIII. And that was really, that marked the breaking up of the Middle Ages. Right? So, even though it was still a couple centuries before the Reformation, uh, that to strike the, well, this isn't the Pope. This is God. Right? The, the Son of God, God incarnate, King of creation, Lord of history, the creator of, of the heavens, the judge of the living and the dead. So even the slightest humiliation would have been infinite in magnitude, but this is the sum of all humiliation it would seem that you could come up with. It would be hard to come up with, with more. Okay, but let's go on now to the interior sufferings that are not so visible, and this would be the principal sufferings the spiritual sufferings. And so we can start again with what's more exterior would be the betrayal of Judas and the other apostles. So friendship betrayed. And here too, he's redeeming a particular kind of sin. He's redeeming all the sins of ingratitude, all the sins of betrayal, all the sins in which love is betrayed and trust is betrayed. That's why he wanted to undergo these. And so the betrayal of Judas with a kiss after having received so many tokens of intimacy for, for three years. And so many benefits. No, this is... This redeems ingratitude. The privilege of being an apostle. Of working miracles in his name. No, Judas would have worked miracles. We should think. He carried them... He had the trust of carrying the money belt, the common purse. And then there would have been the denial of Peter, the abandonment of all the apostles except one, except for John. And then the general lack of correspondence of the apostles, arguing about who is the greatest, even up to the, to the time of the Passion, to the Last Supper. Right? Even during the very Last Supper, they're talking about who's greatest. Oh, and obviously that would have hurt him interiorly in a very deep way. And then the rejection of those who should have been his greatest defenders, those who sat in the seat of Moses, those who were the sons of Aaron. Right? In other words, Caiaphas and the other members of the Sanhedrin. So that betrayal, even though he wasn't intimate with them, it still was um, a betrayal. And then all of the other disciples who we know later were in the upper room but aren't found at the foot of the cross. Right? Just a few are found at the foot of the cross. Yeah. Mary, the, the three Marys, and, um, and John. Okay. So let's pass now to the more interior suffering that had to do with his... Um, Knowledge of our sins. So he's not just suffering for Judas, but he's suffering for me. So when Christ sweat blood in Gethsemane, right, that in some way is the scene in which many great contemplatives like St. Teresa of Avila, 
they would focus on that scene because in some way we're most involved. We're the ones causing that pain in Jesus, we should think. So let's look at that now. So he's exteriorly he's sweating blood. And we saw that that's the effect of a tremendous interior trauma. Now, some contemporary scripture scholars, unfortunately, um, discount the historical reality of this. Like people like Raymond Brown, other people who've written large volumes on the Passion. And we can't follow that, no, because scripture is inspired. It's an inspired text. And what the, the gospel writers assert as having taken place historically is asserted by God. No, that's the Catholic faith about the inspiration of Scripture. And so if the Gospel writers assert this as something that truly happened to Jesus, God is asserting it. Right? And we must not think we know better. We weren't there, for one thing. Okay, so we, he did sweat blood, and it's not something impossible. Doctors know about this. And we should connect it with the greatest of temptations and traumas, um, of the interior. Now, we can't see the devil um, tempting him directly in Gethsemane as happened earlier. But we should think, nonetheless, that this is his greatest temptation. And that the, the temptations in the 40 days after his baptism were a kind of prelude to this. And the same kind of temptation. So, in the 40 days, and we'll look at this, we'll have a whole talk on the temptations of Christ. He was tempted, basically, to redeem the world in some other way than through suffering. Right? To redeem the world through bread, and, through bread, through providing for our material needs. To redeem the world through spectacle, throwing himself off yeah. and being saved. In other words, precisely not by suffering, but being saved from suffering. And the third, through political power. And so, here too, we can imagine the devil tempting him in Gethsemane. And I thought, again, that was brilliant in Mel Gibson's Passion, the Passion of the Christ. He introduces Satan right there and has him say very telling things. No man can redeem so much sin. Right? You can't do it. It's impossible. And so that would be one thought. And then, just even before that, the extremity of the suffering. No man can support so much suffering. Perhaps the devil was, and our Lord willed to think. No, he willed to be tempted in these ways. To redeem us from um, well, other kinds of sins in which we aren't faithful, in which we abandon, in which we give up. And then he would have tempted him with the the quantity of human sin that he came to expiate. No, no one can atone for so much sin. And this would be the principal part of his suffering there. To see, as it were, in his imagination, in his mind's eye, all the deformity of all human sin from the beginning of the world until the end. Right? And so this is really the center of the passion. And it's where, again, where we're involved because we're included in that in that sum of all human sin. And then it, it's reasonable to think the devil would have tempted him with all of those for whom his sacrifice would be in vain. All of those who would continue obstinate in sin to the end. And even that supreme offering wouldn't save. And then the thought of the ingratitude. Perhaps people who are in a state of grace, but who, who take it for granted, who, who are ungrateful to the gifts received. And especially those who should be the most fervent. Those who receive the most gifts of grace. Whether it's holy orders, religious vocation, or simply a deeper knowledge of the faith. All the sins of sacrilege in human history, all the sins of scandal, no one, these would have been the things that caused him to sweat blood. 
the ingratitude with regard to his greatest gift because he could foresee. Now, what I'm pre- presupposing here something we'll talk about later that Jesus had the vision of God throughout his earthly life. And in the vision of God, you can see um, also the, uh, the blessed, they see God, but they also see us. In other words, the blessed in heaven see in the vision whatever um, pertains to them. So, for example, if we pray to a saint, the saint knows that, no, because that pertains to them. Um, St. Patrick today. Um, now, every sin, every heart, every man pertains to Jesus. And so, in the vision, he would have seen every man in his human soul. And so, he could have atoned for it. And he could see it all at once, as it were. And thus, he would see the history of the future of the church, and thus all the ingratitude in that history. There's a a priest who who founded a a religious congregation um, of sisters to pray for fallen priests. There's an interesting book, um, and he's a prophet of the priesthood. His name is Father Fitzgerald, and he says um, something about Gethsemane, very profound. He says, there's not one of us priests... Who, have, who has not heard sufficient confessions to understand why Jesus sweat blood in Gethsemane. You know, if you hear a few confessions, you can understand it. Let alone if you're hearing... See, Jesus in Gethsemane, it's as if he's hearing the confessions of mankind. But he's not simply hearing somebody else's confessions. He's taking them on as if they were his so that he can atone for them. But you can't take them on unless you make them present to yourself. Now, this is really the central part of what we should understand by devotion to the Sacred Heart. Devotion to the Sacred Heart is devotion to this heart of Jesus that wanted to atone, to wanted to make reparation for all human sin. And thus, especially, these sins of ingratitude. And that's what he said to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. Right? When he when he revealed to her, back in the 17th century, the devotion to the Sacred Heart, it was precisely this question, above all, the the theme of reparation and ingratitude. He said, I feel this ingratitude of those to whom he gave more. So, not, not the ingratitude, I don't know, of the infidel, of people who never heard about Christianity, of Muslims or Buddhists, or something like that. But above all, the ingratitude of of those who receive the most gifts. I feel this more than all that I suffered during my passion. Right? He, tells, he told St. Mary, Margaret Mary that it was this interior pain that he felt much more than all the physical pains of his passion. And then he goes on, if only they would make me some return for my love, I should think but little of all I've done for them and would wish were it possible to suffer still more. But the sole return they make for all my eagerness to do them good is to reject me and treat me with coldness. And so he appeals to St. Margaret Mary, do thou at least console me by supplying for their ingratitude as far as thou art able. No, and we should all take this to heart, right? We should make this our own to console Jesus in Gethsemane. And this is what St. Teresa would do also. No, she would imagine herself there because she could think, well, he was... Um, he was weighed down by the sins but he would have known also the fidelities and perhaps by being faithful and putting myself there with him when he was lacking the company of when his three beloved disciples fell asleep I could at least um, give him some consolation and we can we can do that as well and so the greatest of all of all the pains of Christ would be this weight of human sin seen in all its disorder, malice, and cruelty, in its offense to God. Now, this is something that we can't, we, we don't know what sin is. That's, that's why we do it. If, if we knew what it was, we wouldn't do it. But we don't know what it is. Now, Jesus is the only one who perfectly knows what sin is, because he knows the Father. Right? In other words, if sin is an offense 
to the to the love of God, to the mercy of God. Well, if you don't know God and the extent of his love, sin seems like little. But if you perfectly know God, then you know what sin is. So really, Jesus is the only one who could properly do contrition for sin. Well, that makes sense. We can't. I mean, we try. We have to. But, but we, don't, we don't grasp what sin is because we don't know God. And so it would have been precisely Jesus who could do, as it were, an act of contrition for all of our sins. And so contrition, so let's look at that now. Christ's act of contrition, as it were, for all human sin. So, contrition is the sorrow for sin um, that we should feel. No? And we feel it in proportion to our charity. The more charity, the more we feel contrition. Because the more we're sorry that we've offended God. Right? So, Christ would be the only one who could love God as God deserves to be loved. And thus, the only one who could properly atone. Now, he made himself victim of our sins, and he took, he took them upon himself as if he were the culpable party, and thus prostrated himself spiritually before God in solidarity with us, right? because he's our head. He became man precisely to be the head of the human race, and that means putting himself in solidarity with all human sin. Right? And so this would be the, the heart of the passion. We could say the secret heart in which he makes himself, as it were. Now, he's not responsible. No, he, I mean, Christ can't lie to himself. But because of the solidarity of love, he took our sins as his so as to atone for them, since we don't. Right? And so he would make the act of contrition that we should, but don't. And so this, it would be a kind of rending of the heart for having offended God. And so Christ in Gethsemane would have more sorrow than any man could have, but we should say more sorrow than all humanity combined, I think is, is the right way to understand this. Because he's experiencing sorrow for all humans. And now we can't, we can't do that. But if, if we were to say, make, I don't know, the spiritual exercises and, and really put ourselves in a good spiritual state and make an act of contrition for the sins of our life, if we do that, I mean, it's, it's a devastating, it's an incredibly devastating experience. Well, we have to imagine Christ doing that right, but for every human being. Right? This would be what he experienced at Gethsemane. I didn't, so that's the meaning of what Isaiah said. Surely he hath borne our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Right? Interiorly. There's a great preacher from the 17th century, Bossuet. He writes, Truly the grief of this alone would have killed him if he had not held back his soul in order that he might still, because it wasn't his time to die the night before at Gethsemane, he had to be crucified. But, but it could have killed him, no, if he had let it. But he, he would not, he did not will to die in the Mount of Olives. But he shed his blood, the bloody sweat of his agony, in order to show us that that sin alone, that, I'm sorry, that sin alone, without the help of an executioner, was sufficient to strike his death blow. That's, that's very profound. It's, what Christ shows us in Gethsemane is that the principal cause of his death isn't Caiaphas, isn't Pontius Pilate. No, just what we talked about last week. The principal cause is us, is all, all sin of all human history. And he didn't need an executioner. That would have been enough. But he chose to have an executioner to add to his suffering, all the dimensions of suffering, right? physical as well as interior. Now, we see the fullest extent of this in his very mysterious words, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? 
And this is, obviously, it's, they're puzzling words to exegetes, to, to theologians. What could he mean by that? Why have you abandoned me? Now, the text, he's citing Psalm 22, which is a messianic psalm, precisely about Christ's death. It describes his hands and feet being pierced, his, all his bones being uh, exposed and perhaps dislocated. So he's, the first thing that he's doing is he's showing that that psalm is being realized in his person. So that's one sense. But what more does it... And the psalm, by the way, ends with his triumph. It, it ends um, with his, um, the conversion of the Gentiles as the fruit of his suffering. If you look at the whole psalm. But what should, how should we take that? My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? How could he suffer abandonment by God? And what does that mean? Would it mean that he's abandoned in the sense that the hypostatic union was broken? No, that's, that's totally impossible. Right? What God took on, he never relinquishes. So when the Son of God took the humanity of Jesus to be his, that remains for, for eternity. Even in the tomb, the body of Jesus' body was the body of God. And Jesus' soul, separated, was the soul of the Son of God. The human soul of the Son of God. Right? So it's not that the hypostatic union was broken or something, so that Christ was in reality, in interior reality, abandoned by God. Certainly not. So it doesn't mean that. So what does it mean? Was it mean that he was abandoned by um, not being loved by God? Obviously not. No, in fact, this would be when he's most lovable. He's always lovable. But here, he's more lovable than ever. Right? And that's precisely why he wanted to suffer all this, so that we would love him. Was he abandoned in the sense of suffering the pains of hell? Some theologians hold this. What should we think about that? What are the pains of hell, in essence? Desperation. Could Christ suffer desperation? No. Hatred of God for putting you there. Could Christ suffer that? Of course not. The pains of hell are pains that Christ um, could not suffer because they're the most opposite to him as can be conceived. So he, he suffered, but not that. Yeah. He suffered contrition, which is very different than the... Um, there's a remorse of an unrepentant person that's not contrition, but is, in a sense, hatred of God's justice. That's the pains of hell, right? And Christ did not suffer that. Was he abandoned by... Losing the beatific vision. Some, some theologians think this. I think it's a mistake. Because it was precisely the vision of God that enabled him, we said, to fully suffer for every human sin because it enabled him to see, as it were, every human sin. So it wouldn't be in that way either that he was abandoned. So how then was he abandoned? Well, St. Thomas Aquinas um, thinks he was abandoned in two senses, exteriorly and interiorly in the emotional level. Exteriorly, it's easy to see. That's obvious. We say that someone is, when parents abandon a child, they don't protect it. Right? They let it suffer whatever comes its way when you abandon a child. Well, that's, certainly Jesus was abandoned in that way. It was his, every, before that, when, um, when harm was to befall Jesus, he would walk through the midst of them because it wasn't his hour. But now it is his hour. It's the hour in which he was, as it were, abandoned, turned over to all the powers of darkness. Turned over to all his adversaries. And above all, the principal adversary, which isn't Caiaphas, but Satan. And so he was abandoned in that sense of not being protected, of being allowed to be buffeted by Satan in every way that Satan wanted. And of course, Christ wanted it because he wanted that precisely to redeem us. 
So that's, I think, the, the more obvious sense in which he was abandoned. Right? And that doesn't cause any particular difficulty. But I believe there's a more profound sense as well that St. Thomas Aquinas and the other um, great theologians and the, especially the great mystics bring out that he would have been abandoned also in the sense of emotional desolation. And this is something that the great saints are given the privilege of sharing, as it were, experience. We call that the dark night of the spirit. The dark night of the spirit, there are two dark nights, according to the mystical writers. Um, One dark night um, that purges the soul of attachments to sensible consolations. The dark night of the soul. That wouldn't be this. But there's another dark night, the night of the spirit, in which the, um, the saint is purged, as it were, even from any consolation that's purely spiritual. The consolation of having a sense of, say, heaven, of the presence of God, a sense of um, the reality of, uh, of the goodness of God. No, and so great saints, like in our time, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, if you read her, her letters, her notebooks, for 50 years she was in this state in which she had no consolation whatsoever in total feelings, emotional feelings of desolation. Now, when the press heard about it, when this book came out a couple of years ago, you know, the press said, oh, Mother Teresa had doubts about faith. Ridiculous. No, they weren't, there's no doubt about faith there. It's, on the contrary, it's the supreme strength of faith that God allows these trials in the saints so that their faith can be strengthened because it gets no support from feeling. It's the complete loss of any feeling of God's presence so that the, per- the saint has to go by faith alone. Well, John of the Cross is the one who, who brilliantly analyzes this. Anyway, so that would be the, to give us a hint. But that's just a hint. No, Christ doesn't allow his saints to suffer more than he does. He gives them a tiny taste of what he drinks to the fall. And so, but that's how we should try to approach it. That he would have experienced all emotional desolation that it's possible to experience. And that makes sense because when you're thinking about sin and its hideousness, its deformity, it, what it causes, the love that it extinguishes, the, the love of God that it tramples, when you think about that, of course, those reflections create desolation. They don't create consolation. And so, Christ's emotional life, we can't penetrate Christ's emotional life. But the great theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, has this principle, which I think is very wise. Christ had, we, because of original sin, our emotional life um, has a life of its own. And we don't, we can't dominate it. No, we we, that's one of the effects of original sin. We call it concupiscence. That we're not able to rationally control our passions. We can, to, to the extent that we acquire virtue, to a certain extent. But we can't, um, we can't simply will to feel what we will to feel. Yeah. Or, or rather, we can't simply feel what we will to feel. But Christ could. Christ could because he was immune to original sin. He's unfallen, perfect. He's perfect man. And so he would have had a perfect dominion over his emotional states. And so he would have here willed his emotional state to perfectly do what he wanted to do, which is to atone. In other words, to experience every desolation, which is the worst kind of suffering. Right? The, the suffering of the most extreme depression and desolation. Now, how could he have suffered this? Um, um, St. Ignatius describes this in his spiritual exercises, the experience of desolation, um, darkening of the soul, trouble of the mind, movement to base and earthly things, um, restlessness, feeling apathetic, tepid, sad, separated from one's creator and Lord. Well, clearly, that's what Jesus willed to, to feel emotionally, even though, obviously, he's the most closely united to God. A hypostatic union. He's God. But he willed to feel the separation emotionally, which is we call desolation. 
And he could do this because he had control, as it were, of his emotional states. But it's a kind of miracle. Because normally, what happens in the spiritual life is that the saints are normally the most joyful people. Right? Because they have the liveliest awareness of the goodness of God, of the love of God. Right? And so the saints, I mean, even, even saints who are going through the dark night of the soul, you don't, we don't see it. Right? You look at Mother Teresa and you thought she was joyful. Ex- extraordinarily. No. Um, but so even uh, normally there's a certain overflow from the higher part of the soul to the lower part of the soul. The higher part would be that which is, lives by faith, hope, and charity. The lower part would be our feelings. So normally there's this overflow and that's why the saints are joyous. But sometimes God can miraculously suppress that. And that's the dark night of the soul. Well, that's what Jesus wanted to experience to the fullest. So I think that would be the way we should understand those words. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Exteriorly, yes, but also interiorly. To atone, right? To atone more. John Paul II speaks about this in a great document, Novo Millennio Ineunte. And it's the document that he wrote for the Jubilee in the year 2000, the coming in of the new millennium. And he speaks there. The, the document is about, it's about Jesus and how his humanity that we really can, that it's accessible to us in the Gospels. That we can. Uh, and he speaks in number 27 of that document about the experience of Gethsemane. And so let's just read the the text. He writes, Faced with this mystery, we are greatly helped not only by theological investigation, but also by that great heritage which is the lived theology of the saints. This is very important. When you do theology, um, it's not simply a matter of books. right? It's not a matter of theories. It's the saints give us the greatest insight into theological realities because they're the ones who lived it most fully. Right? They, the ones who, who have the infused knowledge of these um, mysteries of faith. The gifts of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And so, John Paul II writes, The saints offer us precious insights which enable us to understand more easily the intuition of faith. Thanks to the special enlightenment which some of them have received from the Holy Spirit. Or even through their personal experience of those terrible states of trial which the mystical tradition describes as the dark night. Right, that's what we have to use to, to understand Gethsemane. So he continues, Not infrequently, the saints have undergone something akin to Jesus' experience on the cross in the paradoxical blending of bliss and pain. Right, it's not, now that seems to us like it's incompatible. How can you have the vision of God and the most intense pain? Well, human experience shows that we can experience two things at once if they have different causes. In other words, at one and the same time, we can experience one type of emotional um, experience because of one cause and another which has a different object. That can happen. And we see that. Um, it, it's just that because of the unity of the soul, normally there's, it doesn't completely happen. There's an overflow from one to the other. But in Jesus, he willed to, to do away with that overflow, we said. So there could be, at one and the same time, a certain um, we, bliss or peace, anyway, and at the same time, the most excruciating pain. And he takes here um, St. Catherine of Siena as an example. In the dialogue of divine providence, God the Father shows Catherine of Siena how joy and suffering can be present together in holy souls. And a quote from St. Catherine, Thus the soul is blissful and afflicted, afflicted on account of the sins of its neighbor, but blissful on account of the union and affection of charity which it has inwardly received. These souls imitate the spotless lamb, my only begotten son, who on the cross was both blissful and afflicted. These are revelations that Jesus gave to St. Catherine. It's very profound. 
And it's very similar to what St. Thomas Aquinas wrote um, a few decades earlier. St. Catherine was also a Dominican, third order Dominican, and she knew the the works of St. Thomas, but obviously she's being taught by a higher teacher here. But St. Thomas was too, because he too was a great mystic. Most of us don't realize that. He was one of the greatest mystics in the history of the church. And it was interesting. One of the times when Jesus most praised St. Thomas Aquinas, there were two cases in which the Lord spoke to Jesus, uh, to Thomas Aquinas from the crucifix. When he was praying late at night, he would levitate Thomas Aquinas. And um, the sacristan caught him twice. And one time it was when he was working on, on the Passion in the Summa, analyzing precisely this, the mystery of the abandonment. And Jesus said, you have written well of me, Thomas. What would you like as your reward? You alone, Lord, was the right response. Anyway, so what St. Catherine is expressing here is, is very Thomistic. That one can experience bliss and the utmost affliction at the same time because they're caused by two different causes. The, the bliss is seeing the glory of God. But the affliction is seeing precisely the glory of God offended by all human sin. And they go together. It's precisely the knowing God that enables the knowledge of sin to be so afflicting. And then John Paul II cites St. Therese of Lisieux. How she lived her agony in communion with the agony of Jesus, experiencing in herself the very paradox of Jesus' own bliss and anguish. And quote, he quotes her, In the Garden of the of olives, our Lord was blessed with all the joys of the Trinity, yet his dying was no less harsh. It is a mystery, but I assure you that on the basis of what I myself am feeling, I can understand something of it. Like she underwent the dark night of the Spirit in a, in a very, very deep way in her last, um, in her last year, St. Therese of Lisieux. What an illuminating testimony, John Paul II writes. Moreover, the accounts given by the evangelists themselves provide a basis for this intuition on the part of the church of Christ's consciousness when they record that even in the depths of his pain he died imploring forgiveness for his executioners and expressing to the father his ultimate filial abandonment father into your hands I commend my spirit and we should see in that line something of peace Right? He's, it's the peace of having done what he was born to do. You know, earlier, during his public ministry, he said, how I burn, you know, that this fire um, be ignited. How he burned to drink his chalice. Well, now he's drunk his chalice to the, to the bottom. And so there's the satisfaction, there's a joy, the joy of having redeemed mankind. It's just that mankind was redeemed through the most excruciating suffering. And so there's the suffering and the joy because there's the greatest motive for joy. It's done. The work of redemption is done. And so both things are happening at once. And, and we too can be involved in both things. Our sins were the cause of his pain. Right? And we should we have to remember that. It wasn't somebody else. It wasn't the Pharisees no, that caused his death. It was, it was our sins. But, um, but at the same time, we said we can console him through our fidelity. Because that too he saw. Okay. And I thought we'd just conclude by looking at Our Lady because she shared in the most intimate way with her son. And so she is the mother of sorrows as he is the man of sorrows. She is the most perfect reflection of the interior sufferings of her son as well as... She couldn't share the exterior ones, no, but she, she shared the interior ones. And her suffering is that of compassion, right? She is the mother of compassion. Compassion means to suffer with, literally, right? And that's, of course, what she did. And compassion 
depends on love. The greater the love, the greater the compassion. Where there's perfect love, it makes two souls like one, and thus it makes what one experiences experienced by the other. Whether it's joy or sorrow, honor or humiliation. Now, and so in the case of, of Mary, that union would be perfect. It would be total because of her fullness of grace, but also because she's his mother who's full of grace. So on the natural level, but it's the perfect natural level and the perfect supernatural level. And so when, the, when Jeremiah, we said at the beginning, the lamentations of Jeremiah over the destruction of Jerusalem, the church applies them to Jesus in the Good Friday um, liturgy and the, the Tenebrae service. But they also get applied to Our Lady. Look and see if there's any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. What can I say for you? To what can I compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What can I liken to you that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For vast as the sea is your ruin. Now, Jeremiah's weeping over over Jerusalem and what he puts in the, the daughter of Zion, in other words, the whole people's sorrow over the destruction of Jerusalem, that's a supreme sorrow. No? But it's still, it's only a figure of Mary's sorrow. Because she, she was sorrowing over the destruction of the true Jerusalem. God made man, the true temple. God made man. And she knew it's the full depth. She knew the interior of her son's suffering. And so it would have been the greatest suffering of any creature. Right? Our, Jesus suffered the greatest suffering, but it's the suffering proper to God made man. And Mary would have suffered the greatest suffering of any pure creature. Suffering of compassion. St. Bernard has a beautiful meditation on um, Mary's suffering, and as it was foretold in the Sword of Simeon, 40 days after the birth of Jesus. Now, St. Simeon wanted her to carry this sorrow throughout her whole life so that she could prepare herself for what was to happen at the foot of the cross. And so St. Bernard um, makes this reflection. So St. Simeon said to Mary, a sword shall pierce your soul. O blessed mother, truly a sword has pierced your soul. Besides, if it did not pierce your soul, it would not pierce the flesh of your son because she put her soul, as it were, before uh, on top of her son's heart. Indeed, after your son, Jesus, gave up his life, the cruel lance did not touch his soul at all, though it opened his side, but it pierced your soul instead. It is certain that his soul is no longer present, but your soul could not be torn away from that place. Therefore, a violent pain pierced your soul, so that we speak of you as more than a martyr. Now, what a beautiful expression. Mary's more than a martyr. Because she shared not the exterior sufferings, but the interior ones. I am sure that for you, what you felt in sharing your son's passion was even worse than the sensation of physical suffering. Was not the word that your son spoke from the cross, Mother, behold your son. I'm sorry, woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Was it not that worse than a sword for you? Did it not pierce your soul? Penetrating to the vision of soul and spirit. What an exchange. In place of Jesus, you're handed John. The servant in place of the master. The disciple in place of the teacher. The son of Zebedee in place of the son of God. A mere man in place of true God. Do not wonder, brothers, that Mary is said to have been a martyr in her soul. If he could die in the body, why could she not die with him in her heart? It was charity greater than that of any other man that made Christ die. And it was also charity that made Mary die with him in her heart. And after that charity, no other like charity ever was. No, or we could say ever will be. Very often Mary is in depictions of the crucifixion in the Renaissance. The, the artist will put Mary in a position that mirrors her son. So that she's mystically dying as it were. Yeah. Even often with her arms spread out like, like her son and that expressed this profound truth. 
that in some sense she, she sacrificed her son because she too would have had these uh, obviously the supreme sorrow but also the knowledge that his work was done that he did she wouldn't have tempted him everybody else would have tempted him to come down from the cross but Mary would not have No, she would have as it were sacrificed him if need be for the redemption of mankind and the popes in, in, express that in, in the Marian encyclicals in the 20th century they speak of Mary in some sense as bringing Jesus as it were to the sacrifice for the sake of our redemption spiritually obviously by not opposing it no, by not and so she's the great model of what we're all called to do which is to participate as much as we can in Christ's interior and so when we do the, the way of the cross we look at the exterior but we should also try to penetrate the interior and when we meditate on the passion we should try to meditate on Christ's interior and Mary helps us because she is the one who most perfectly did that and when we, imit- when we think of the imitation of Christ, we want to think of the imitation of his interior, and especially when? In his passion. Right? So praying on the passion is, um, is the great Christian exercise. And it helps us to do what we all have to do, which is to um, complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. Now that's St. Paul in Colossians 1.24 that we too are called to participate and God gives us plenty of opportunities so we should join ours with his and try to uh, to join it with his interior and to recognize and the key thing to recognize in his suffering his love which is why he suffered 